News of the scandal became public back in January of 2009. That's when it was announced that two former public works managers and four local businessmen were charged with bribery and fraud. Tulsa Fire, Tulsa IMSA, the railroad crews even were all out here. They put their heads together, were able to come up with a plan to get this uh, truck out of the bridge. They did it very, very well. We were all expecting a big crash, uh, but they were able to, to connect two cables to the truck and lower it down. Well, and we're standing right here in front of the house where the shooting happened last night. And I'm going to step out of the way and show you. If you take a look, you can actually see the bullet holes. We're going to zoom in on the window there. And a shocking confession caught on camera. The man accused of killing his wife and five kids in Florida admits to the crime. And you can see right behind me, the medical examiner is here now on the scene. They're getting ready to take uh, this body to the funeral home. We just got the report just moments ago, and they do believe this fire was arson. The list really goes on. That's right, but there's one business sector actually thriving in the down economy. Jacqueline Sid has more. Exotic fish, coral, even a tank full of sharks. Just a few of the attractions found at the Oklahoma Aquarium. Does he like bananas? My day was spent with a curator. Our first task was to feed the aquarium's two beavers, Diga and Doya, who only come out once a day to eat. They are given a mixture of fruits and veggies. My goal was not to become food myself. Oh, Lord, he's looking at my shoe like it's a piece of meat. The beavers were rescued a few years ago and spend their days sleeping in their den, except, of course, when it's time to eat. Oh, look, this one's hungry. They're so careful the way that they eat, too. They're very well-mannered, it seems like. Yeah. Now it was the sharks' turn to feast. The aquarium has the largest collection of bull sharks in the world. This task was not for the faint of heart. Get ready, fish. Here I come. We prep food generally almost every day. Today we're going to be prepping shark food, which is over 100 pounds of food. It's messy, it's smelly, but you kind of get used to it. We don't even notice it anymore. I'm um, taking the fish, the salmon that they're cutting up for each one of the sharks, and so I'm taking a pill like this, putting it inside the meat, and then I'm injecting the fish with what's called thiamine. It's basically a vitamin blast for that fish. And then I put it over here in the tray. Mm. Who says I'm a girly girl, right? These sharks better be appreciative of the meal that I have fixed for them. I might put this in uh, someone's locker at work. We'll see. This fish is cold. Oh, it suck to be a fish. He's going to make some shark happy, though, so that's good. Is there a way to get the fishy smell off of you after you're done doing this every day? I feel like I'm prepping for surgery right now. All right, here comes the real test. A little bit more soap. Now the part I had been dreading feeding the sharks by hand. Curators use a special pole with a grip to feed each one. It's kind of hard to pick up with this little guy. This is like a carnival game. You'll see as she comes around the tank, you're just going to set it in the water. She'll open her mouth and feed it. Just grab a piece of matzo. Right now I'm getting ready to feed the sharks. These are the lemon sharks. Oh my gosh. Wow. Perfect. Unbelievable. 20 minutes later. Okay, it's the last one. That's the last one? Yeah. Just chunk it in. Chunk it in accomplished. With my body still intact, I was off to clean the coral reef. Divers have to do this daily. I suit up and slowly descend under the sea. Under the sea. Under the sea. Darling, it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. It takes me a minute to find my bearings, but once I do, the sea comes to life. Everywhere I look, fish swirl around me, anxious for their food. Being inside the tank was incredible. Head diver Bill Dossis and I begin the slow process of cleaning the coral reef. This involves using a brush and going back and forth over the coral until a white color appears. Divers say this is necessary to maintain the balance of the ecosystem for the marine life. And basically, just hold it in the water long enough and he'll come to you. Okay. And then if you see him opening his mouth, there you go. One set of reptiles who don't have a home are the aquarium's two loggerhead sea turtles. They're very curious. They'll come up at your head. You just have to be careful and know where they are. The turtles have been in captivity too long to be released into the wild. The aquarium hopes to build a tank large enough for them to live and also for the public to enjoy them. You need to respect your punishment. That was a bad thing you did. I don't want you hurting anybody else. That's why you should be in jail forever, so accept it. 
These are the emotional words of a child to the man who brutally raped her. God made you, but you are not like God's person. You are like the devil's person. You should have been on God's side, and this would never have happened. Back then, I was the little angelfish, and you were the great white shark. September 20th, 2007 started off like any other day for a family until one man's decision changed their lives forever. Uh, she was playing in the backyard and with the dogs, and um, she climbed over the fence to go see if her little friend was uh, next door. And um, on her way back to our house, um, instead of going up next to the house, she went to the edge of the driveway, and uh, Douglas Polk Jr. happened to drive by and said he lost his dog. Polk told her he had a picture of his dog, and believing him, the then five-year-old approached the car. He pulled her through the window and sped off. At some point, um, took her clothing off, um, sexually assaulted her, and then left her um, about seven miles away from our house on a dirt road. Naked and bleeding, she stumbled to a nearby home and began to cry. A neighbor saw her and called for help. Her attacker, Douglas Polk, was captured two and a half years later and pled guilty. She says the child abuse network has played a big part in her healing. They've really helped me because I've been through some hard times and they've got me through a lot. The organization provided the forensic and mental health services her family desperately needed. The goal is to allow the child to come, talk about their experiences and tell what happened to them and only have to do it one time. Today she is eight years old and will soon be starting the third grade. I'm going to forget all about you and go on with my life how I want it to be without any bad person stopping me. I was only five years old, now I'm eight. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. N and nothing's stopping me, especially you. The Oklahoma Cold Case Investigators Association met to review the case of Brittany Phillips. The college freshman was raped and suffocated in her South Tulsa apartment in 2004. Yesterday, investigators from around the state reviewed the case, hearing from Tulsa officers and from Brittany's mother. The group meets quarterly to share information about solved cases and new investigating techniques. The next meeting is in December when investigators focus on an unsolved case in Tahlequah. Well, there's now a delay in the fight on whether or not to put the Ten Commandments outside of an Oklahoma courthouse. Commissioners in LaFleur County have voted to table the issue until the U.S. Supreme Court reviews a related case about a Mojave Desert monument. Last month, a Denver judge ordered the Ten Commandments monument that stood outside the Haskell County Courthouse be removed. It could be months until the higher court hears that case. Memphis Mayor Pro Tem Myron Lowry is the subject of much controversy after his fist bump with the Dalai Lama. A lot of people talking about this, a sign of disrespect or an informal greeting amongst friends. You be the judge. Fox's Lauren Johnson has what some think about that gesture. Well, Ron, this fire started shortly after 9 o'clock last night, and luckily no one was hurt. But I can tell you, as we drove into the town, there was a thick haze all over the town and a very thick smell of smoke. And if you see behind me, you can see there's still lots of spots burning here. The firefighters are still on the scene. They're getting ready to put some more water on this blaze. Now, we're told the fire started in a video store, then quickly spread to two nearby buildings through the roof. Now, take a look at these photos sent to us by 11-year-old Riley Roberts from Haskell. You can see just how bad the smoke and flames got there last night. Now, many people in the town came out to watch as their community center burned to the ground. Now, we can tell you no one was inside the buildings at the time of the fire and no one was hurt. At this time, it's not exactly clear what actually started it. And we did speak to the fire chief here in Haskell, and he tells us the buildings are very old, and this is actually the second major fire this town has seen. Residents say they are heartbroken at the loss. It makes me feel awfully sad. Uh, the buildings are such historic buildings, and we lost some in major fires several years ago, and now we've lost these, and it really hurts a town that's struggling and uh, to stay on their feet. The volunteer firefighters worked all through the night to get this blaze under control, and we're told most of them have other jobs that they will be back at this morning. 
Now, as I said just a minute ago, the firefighters are still on the scene. We just saw them rolling out some more hoses just a minute ago. They're going to be putting some more water on uh, the blaze to try to keep it under control. A minute ago, they were telling us they were just going to let it burn, but now it looks like they're going to be adding some more water just to keep this fire from spreading. And I also want to let you know, Ron and Ann, we've been hearing explosions all morning long, and I asked them what it was, and they believe it's some aerosol cans and some other things inside that community center that's causing those explosions. So if you hear those, that's what it is. Reporting live in Haskell, I'm Sharon Phillips, Fox 23 News. Air traffic controllers say the pilot reported hitting some birds right after takeoff, which makes us ask the question, is that something you think about right before you fly? Most passengers we caught up with at the airport say no. Not really, because uh, most companies uh, you can trust for, for looking after the aircraft well. Uh, the past two years in, uh, in America had been an accident-free in the sense that nobody was killed in, a, in an aircraft uh, uh, accident. So that's a good record. People like Pete Botha say he's just grateful everyone made it out alive. We think that all went well because the pilots were well trained, they knew what they were doing. Uh, yeah, it's just a great moment for, for the, for the uh, uh, industry. Birds causing a plane to crash is a little unusual. 8,000 incidents reported just last year, and most travelers say they don't plan on changing their routine. I live in North Carolina. I come to Oklahoma, Texas, California. What am I going to do? Walk? Walk or drive? No, I'm, I'm flying. The Tulsa International Airport takes the bird problem very seriously. Out on the runway, uh, we'll use hazing techniques, which basically are pyrotechnics that we shoot off that startle the birds and cause them to fly away. Other ways of getting rid of the dangerous birds include playing distressed bird signals in the parking lot. This will usually cause the birds to fly away. In Tulsa, Sharon Phillips, Fox 23 News. hearing is not a war zone, but a Tulsa Police Department special operations drill. And today was my chance to go behind the scenes and bring you a closer look at how they sharpen their skills. Our training begins in the weight room. Members of the special operations team or the SOT need to be in top physical condition. We might have to travel over different kind of terrain. Um, go up several flights of stairs, et cetera, and we're all carrying, um, you know, 40 to 60 pounds of extra equipment at the time. They have to be able to handle their own body weight and also perform anaerobic and aerobic fitness. Next, it's off to the shooting range. The goal here, hit the target using a Remington Precision Rifle with a scope. Nice <laughs> shot. You hit three out of your four circles. The white target is the hostage, the red is uh, the hostage taker okay. and almost simulating having them maybe around the neck or behind them okay. and trying to go mobile with them. For me, this exercise was a little bit easier than the first. Nice shot. <laughs> you did well. You hit the shot. First time, right out of the box. It was fantastic. One. SO team members go through extensive training to be accurate and hit their target under the most stressful of situations. Yeah, what do you think about doing? is getting your nose relatively close to this, which is called the charging handle. And I want you to be able to look with both your eyes. Keep both your eyes open. See the red dot in there? Uh -huh. Put that in the middle of the target. One. One. Three. Next, it was time for some shooting and moving drills. Yes. Yes. What you're going to do is you're going to take the same grip, and now you're going to walk and Oh, shoot. great. <laughs> and not only are you going to walk, because we walk around things. You know, have you ever been in a living room? Right. Yeah. Coffee tables, yeah, dogs, cats, little kids. Stuff's all around so you. So you have to be able to do like this. Next up, a live training exercise involving a suspect. This drill involves using what's called a pepper ball non-lethal weapon. This allows the SOT member to disable a suspect and take them into custody without hurting them. The SOT will often use what's called a flashbang to distract a suspect and free a hostage. Suspect! Suspect down! Suspect down! Right. Yeah, come out! Right. Come out! Miss, come out! Secure him. Let's get the hostage. Let's get the hostage. I'm coming, Brandon. Come around. Young five, take your hand. When you pull the pin out, you got to hold the spoon down. Okay. 
or else the fuse start ticking and you only have a second and a half before it goes boom in your hand. Members will often encounter barricaded doors. In this instance, I am taught how to deploy a flashbang to distract the suspect. Bang away! After four hours of training with the special operations team, I now understand why patience is key when dealing with a crisis situation. And we're clear here. The Tulsa Police Department special operations team trains over 400 hours a year to be ready at a moment's notice. In North Tulsa, I'm Sharon Phillips, Fox 23 News.